Hungarian folk tales. Butcher boy George. Once upon a time, in a land far, far beyond the hills, there lived a youth named Butcher Boy George. You could travel the length and breadth of the land, visit seven villages, and never find his match. So strong was the boy that he needed no meat cleaver. He could kill a bull with his bare hands. One day, Butcher Boy George decided to bid farewell. So he said goodbye to his father and his mother, and he set out to see the world. He rambled and ambled across the lands, and on the seventh day of his journey, he arrived at the edge of a huge, dark forest. He looked to the left, he looked to the right, to see if perhaps he could espy the glow of a campfire. And indeed, he suddenly saw the shimmer of flames flickering between the trees. He set out towards the fire, but then thought better of it, for he feared that perhaps the fire had been lit by bandits. But hardly had he taken a step, and again the glow of the flames flickered in front of him. Again he turned to the left, he turned to the right, but no matter which way he turned, the shimmer of the campfire always followed his gaze. Oh, said Butcher Boy George, come what may, I will not turn away any more like a sheep trying to flee the wolves. And he went straight in the direction of the fire. When he reached the fire, he saw an old woman poking at its coals, trying to kindle their glow. He greeted her. Good evening, good woman. Good evening to you, my boy. What brings you to this distant forest? I'm searching for lodging, good woman. If only I could find a place to rest my head. I could give you a place to rest your head, but I must warn you that every night demons come to my house at the first stroke of midnight, and they bring grief to anyone they find. I do not fear, good woman. I only want a warm bed for the night. The rest is my concern. The old woman mumbled something to herself, blinked with her falcon-like eyes, led the boy to his room, made his bed, and left him there. The boy went to bed, and he soon fell asleep. But he did not sleep long, for at the first stroke of midnight, the demons began knocking at the doors and windows, making such a clatter that the whole house began to shake. Even Butcher Boy John felt frightened by this. Leaping from his bed, he took his stick in his hand and waited to see what would happen. Suddenly, the door gave a mighty creak, a tremendous chest flew into the room, a long walking stick popped out of the chest, wearing a red cap on its end, and lunged at Butcher Boy George. But Butcher Boy George knew a thing or two about demons. He knocked the red hat from the end of the walking stick, the hat rolled under the bed, and as all the demon's strength was held in this hat, the walking stick too quickly took refuge under the bed. So Butcher Boy George leapt out the door, turned to make the sign of the cross on it so that the demon would be trapped, and withdrew to hide out on the porch. Meanwhile, day was beginning to break outside. Cockerels had begun to crow, and the demons returned to their realm. As soon as the demons had departed, Butcher Boy George went into the old woman's kitchen. You cannot imagine the spectacle that awaited him there. The fire was blazing high, and its flames licked at the bottom of a soot-black cauldron of boiling tar. In front of the fireplace, a beautiful young maiden sat stirring the tar and sobbing to herself. Why are you crying, gentle maiden? Oh, my poor soul, the maiden replied. Alas, I have good reason to sob. I stir this boiling tar for my own weak body. And who told you to do this? asked Butcher Boy George. 
The old woman who took you in, she hired me as a cleaning girl, but she did not need a cleaning girl. In truth, she seeks to make a witch of me, but since I refuse to become a witch, she will burn my body to ashes and dust in this boiling tar. Fie, cried Butterboy George. I will put a stop to this. Do not fear, gentle maiden. Just keep stirring the tar and blowing the coals that they glow red hot beneath the cauldron, for the tar will be the witch's bath water, not yours. Then suddenly the old witch arrived and she asked the girl, Has the tar come to the boil? It has, old woman. It has. And you? Do you want to be a witch? I do not, answered the maiden. I ask you for a second time. Do you want to be a witch? I do not. I ask you for a third and last time. Do you want to be a witch? And I answer for the third time. I do not. Oh, you wretched maiden, into the cauldron with you. But Butcher Boy George had heard quite enough. He leapt out from behind the door, took the witch in his hands, spun her in the air and tossed her into the cauldron of boiling tar. In the blink of an eye, her body sizzled to ash. And now, gentle maiden, the world is ours, said Butcher Boy George. Come with me and we shall be man and wife forevermore. The girl wasted no more time for the brave butcher boy had won her heart. But before they departed, they went to the cellar where there was enough gold and silver for every village in the land. They gathered as much silver and gold as they could and left the rest that others might have some too. And together they lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Lazy Boy Once upon a time, there was a penniless woman. Her husband had died and all she had left was a lazy son. Everyone called him Lazy Jack because he hated to work. The whole year through, he did not a bit of work, simply crouched in the corner in the winter time and dawdled in the shade in the summer time. One day, the poor woman said to him, Dear son of mine, bring me a can of water from the mighty river so that I can wash your filthy shirts and trousers. The lad merely shrugged his shoulders I would gladly go if I weren't so very lazy. But the poor woman continued to plead. Come, my dear boy, if you go, fetch me some water so that I can wash. What will the world say? That I dress you in a dirty shirt and dirty trousers? And she kept pestering him until finally he grabbed a can and plodded along to the river. He dipped the can into the water and was bringing it home. Well, as it so happens, a little fish in the can began to speak. Listen, boy, set me free. Please pour me back into the mighty river. The boy replied, I would gladly pour you back, but I am too lazy to go back to the river. But the tiny fish beseeched him, and finally the lazy boy turned back and poured the little fish back into the water. Again the fish spoke, Thank you for your good deed, but I would like to repay your kindness. If ever there is anything you wish, simply say, Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish. 
and no sooner had he spoken than he disappeared into the waters of the river. Lazy Jack took the water home, and barely had he put down the can when he put his hand on his belly and exclaimed, Mother, I'm hungry. If you are hungry, son, go where you might find something to eat. Suddenly Jack remembered the tiny fish and the promise it had made. Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish. Wine, meat and bread, a sumptuous dish. Hardly had he uttered the words when the table was creaking beneath the weight of food. Jack and his mother both ate their fill and were barely able to stand up from the bench. The poor woman began to do the washing up and Jack lay down in a cool spot behind the house. As he lay there, the king's daughter came strolling along. Ah, lazy Jack, you have time to be lazy even when others are at work? Lazy Jack got angry and retorted. Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish. Make this girl meek and mild, pregnant with child. And miracle of miracles, wonder of wonders, the princess indeed became pregnant. Each day her belly grew a little bit bigger and nine months later she gave birth to a baby boy. The child was beautiful but in vain. The king was not pleased. He besieged his daughter with questions, wanting desperately to know who the father was but she swore on heaven and earth that never had she once passed a night with any man. But the boy must have a father. The earth yields no crop if nothing is sown. Wise men and sages advised the king to gather all the men in the kingdom, every last one, and make them stand in a line. Then they told him to put an apple in the child's hand and wait to see which man he gave it to, for that man must be the child's father. Well, if it's that simple, I will order this to be done. And all the men in the kingdom were ordered to assemble. First came the soldiers, then the reservists, then all the other men. In vain, in vain, the child didn't give the apple to anyone. What could be wrong, wondered the king. Could the wise men have been mistaken? But the wise men insisted they were not mistaken, but that the king had clearly failed to summon all the lads of the land. Again the men were counted, and they realised that they had failed to summon Lazy Jack. So the king sent his soldiers to fetch him that instant. But it took half a day for him to come, for Lazy Jack had been asleep in the attic and waking him up proved quite a task. But when they pushed him in through the door, the small child immediately gave him the apple. And suddenly everything was clear. Lazy Jack was the father of the princess's little boy. The king, of course, had hoped that the father would be a prince or a great man and was not at all pleased at how things had turned out. You have brought shame upon my old head and you should be punished. So the king had his daughter, his grandson, and Lazy Jack placed in a barrel and thrown into the river. The water carried them downstream. At first the princess sobbed and moaned, but soon she realized that although he was lazy, Jack was a good and honest lad. She said to him, listen, Lazy Jack, this barrel is too small for the three of us. I would like a palace the likes of which I am accustomed to. Do something to get us out of this barrel. I would gladly do something, said Lazy Jack, but I am simply too lazy. But the princess continued to beseech him and soon Jack grew tired of listening. Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish, a palace tall with towering walls. He had barely finished his thought when the waters of the river suddenly threw the barrel to the banks, where it broke into pieces. Then they found themselves before the gates of a beautiful palace. Oh, how beautiful, said the princess. This must be our palace. It was indeed their palace, thanks to the tiny fish and his magic. They made it their home and lived together happily. Lazy Jack slept so much that unless the princess had woken him up, 
he might very well have grown roots. And that's the end of my tale about Lazy Jack. Once upon a time, there lived a poor old woman, and she had a cat. The cat was so greedy that he poked his nose into every jug and jar. Then the day came when the old woman could not stand the cat's greedy ways any longer, and she said to him, Get out of my house. You may go wherever you like but never darken my door again. So the greedy cat was forced to go out into the wide world. The cat walked until he came to a bridge, where he sat and gave a sad meow. And as he sat, he caught sight of a fox sitting nearby. The cat prowled slowly around the fox and rustled the bushes. The fox was terrified as he had never seen a cat before and the cat was terrified because he had never seen a fox before so they both just stood there shaking. Which of us should be in charge? What? You don't know who I am. I'm King Kitty. All the animals are afraid of me. Oh, I am ashamed to say that I have never heard of you before, the fox confessed and immediately invited King Kitty to his humble home for a sumptuous supper of chicken, duck, goose, and anything else he could find. Please eat more, Your Majesty. Make yourself at home. The feast was finished, the fox prepared an exceptionally soft bed for King Kitty, who ordered complete silence while he had his royal nap. Get away from here! Don't you know that King Kitty is sleeping in my house? If you wake him now, he's sure to have you executed. Where are you running to? Are the hounds on your tail? Don't ask me, Bear. I was passing Fox's house and he told me to run away because King Kitty sleeps within and if I woke him, he'd have me executed. Hmm, the bear pondered. I have travelled to many lands, but I have never heard of such a feline figure. I shall pay a visit to the fox and see this King Kitty for myself. Oh, Bear, please don't go there, because if you wake King Kitty, he'll have you executed and me along with you. This frightened the bear, who ran and ran until he reached the rabbit. Oh, my, what will happen if King Kitty wakes up and walks out into the forest? I've got a splendid idea. Let's all invite King Kitty to a banquet. If you trust me, I'll go to the fox and invite his majesty. All right, 
I'll go to see if King Kitty is awake and I'll inform him of your wish. Your Majesty, a crow has arrived sent by the animals of the forest to invite you to a royal banquet. King Kitty brushed his white whiskers and said, Very well, you may go and tell the crow I will attend. As evening came, King Kitty began to make himself ready. He waxed his whiskers and left in the company of his host, the fox. The crow met them to show the way. But the crow was too scared to fly down to the ground, and so instead he flew from tree to tree and called, This way, please! This way, please! The other animals soon sighted King Kitty arriving with the fox. Oh, dearie me! Here comes King Kitty! He'll skewer me on his spiky whiskers! But all of a sudden, the animals took fright and fled to all four corners of the forest. And if these foolish animals had not run away, my story would have lasted longer still. <laughs>